Yeah, I'm going to wear it tonight. I brought it all the way here, okay? That way you guys can take pictures and be like, he looks so congressional. How's that? So, um, and there's a lot of glory on this because this is the same jacket I wore um, when I went to the Oval Office last month, prayed over the president, so there's gold dust on it. <clears throat> Just kidding. Um, no, I, uh, yeah, thank you so much. I, I'm really honored to be here with you guys, and I'm just so grateful. Um, I, I love praying communities, and I think it's, you know, it's, it's always a, uh, a boost to my faith. And, you know, as much as I hope tonight that I can encourage you through sharing what I see God doing in, in this hour. Pass me those sunglasses, those glasses in there, Wesley, when you can. Um, I also want, I also am encouraged, and to be honest with you, I needed uh, this, I needed this time of worship, the 2020 glasses with American flags on them. No, no, no. No, 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 I'll find them. Hold on, this, this is an important prop. Okay. Oh, no, where are they? Oh, here they are. I brought these two. These are important. All right, here we go. So we're going to talk about 2020 vision. For America. <laughs> and uh, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about putting on 2020 glasses from heaven to see what God's doing in our nation and around the world. And just to give you a little history, <laughs> just hold on, they're going to take a picture. <laughs> okay, just to give you a, a little up, a little just uh, FYI on my story. So I've, um, for the last 20 years, ever since I was 16 years old, I've been traveling the nations. I've been bringing teams around the world. I have three nonprofits um, that I've established that do prayer, uh, worship, and missions in over 300 cities around the world. And I'm also, of course, part of the community up at Bethel, and I'm a worship leader and a songwriter and, you know, a recording artist and blah, blah, blah. Um, I have four kids, which is what I'm most excited about, and, um, and we have been inspired, obviously, by Wesley and Stacy in their shenanigans around the world with all their kids, and we didn't quite make it to five, but four felt really good. And we've taken our kids around the world, and our kids have grown up seeing God break out in revival, and we really have spent a lot of our time investing in some of the hardest and darkest nations. And I've probably been in four out of the top five most closed nations in the world, and currently I hold visas to a couple of them that are really, really difficult to get. Um, but just to bring you a little bit on on, on our journey, and um, it was about last summer when I started to just feel some shifting in my heart, and... Um, you know, I think probably any father in this room can relate, you know, um, that the older you get, uh, the dreams for your own life begin to diminish a little bit and the dreams for your children begin to increase. And, you know, I am so, I'm so grateful. I mean, I, I was the three chord worship leader, you know, I knew three chords in youth group and never had a dream to do anything more than worship in a hut in China. You know, that was my plan, you know, and I didn't know that I would start businesses and nonprofits and all of the things that we would be able to do and worship, lead worship in stadiums and go in, into some crazy places. Um, but my heart really started to burn for my kids and I started to get really um, agitated when I look at the future of America. And I see the narrative that's being dominated right now, largely by millennials, of a crazy, wild, leftist ideology. That, and, and, you know, I think that being in California exacerbated it. Anybody with me? A few people are nodding your heads. Uh, does, does anyone know that anyone in here not realize that California is crazy? <laughs> okay, now I'm saying that, and I live here, right? I'm, I'm raising my children in this state, and I love the mantle and the mandate and the calling and the destiny on the state. I mean, there has been, and you look, if you look at revival history across America, you know, you see California is always the initiator. You look at Azusa Street. 
Now, because of Azusa Street, 600 million people were baptized in the Holy Spirit. You know, you look at the Jesus people movement. I was going to wear, I have a t-shirt of, um, and I'm, I've been wearing it around just kind of prophetically, but it's a, it's a shirt of the Time magazine cover from 1969. And it's a, guy, it's a hippie with long hair. You know, that's why I tell people I'm not cutting my hair, right? Not a politician. And I don't know if you've read the story of Samson. It didn't end up well for him. <laughs> so I'm not going to repeat those same errors, right? But I... That T-shirt, you know, is a, is a hippie holding up a sign, Jesus saves. And on the cover of Time magazine, I believe it was 1969, uh, the, the title was The Jesus Revolution. And it was all about the summer of love. It was all about San Francisco. It was all about the Jesus people movement. And it was a whole magazine dedicated to this movement across America. Now, is there any Jesus people movement hippies? Around a couple of you guys, yep. So some of you guys knew it and lived through it. I can't tell you how many pastors I meet that were like, yeah, I was like tripping out on acid and like walked into like a vineyard service and <laughs> felt the glory, you know. <laughs> My old pastor, Charles Stock, he was one of those guys, you know. And, it's, and he, they kind of never leave part of the hippiness, you know, which I love. Like it's, I love it, you know. I love the, that spirit. But when you look at California, you see it has been the initiator of great revivals, but it's also been the initiator of literally the worst legislation that's ever come to America. It always begins in California, and it's like the enemy knows the prophetic mantle, the mandate on the state. And so, I mean, look no further than Sacramento, you know, the belly of the beast, or San Francisco, that dominate the narrative of, of this legislation that is literally bringing, and, and what happens, and, you know, Gavin Newsom said it, who's the current governor of California, he prophesied, you know, in San Francisco when they reversed Prop 8, he said, so goes California, so goes the nation. And I have focused my life on the nations of the world, like that's just where I've lived, but in the last few months, probably six, eight months, God has called me to turn my heart to America. And to be honest with you tonight, I feel a little tricked into it. I was flying here. I was, got up at um, five in the morning. I was in Fairfield, California. We did a prayer rally last night and um, got caught on the Bay Bridge, of course, praise God, and got news that there was... Um, meddling that's happening in the election in my district we're contacting the secretary of the state and it's it's actually a really big deal and it's not happening in any other counties in california except for the one that i'm running in interesting i have state senators and i have representatives contact me telling me man they it's <laughs> all these conspiracies that i didn't believe in <laughs> like right and i've been praying and i've been believing and we've been breaking stuff and binding stuff, but then I'm finding out, oh my gosh, this is real. Like there's a spirit that has control. And, um, and I was praying, you know, on the way here, I'm like, God, like, I, why would you do this to my life? <laughs> People liked me before I did this. <laughs> there's been all these hit pieces that have been written recently about me and my family, and it's just what happens, you know, when you stand up and do something like this. But you know, that we wanted to do this for our own name or our own ego or whatever. And I'm, I just laugh. Kate and I, my wife, we just laugh at it. We're like, no, no, people actually genuinely liked us before this. <laughs> right? <laughs> but the moment that you take a stand, and especially politically, you polarize your whole world. People come in with all of their dispositions and all their con preconceived ideas and all of their notions, and it's just like crazy. And meanwhile, I'm sitting here as a dad of four kids, and I'm just like, no, what fires me up is the relentless slaughtering of the unborn. What fires me up is that I don't want my kindergartners learning 15 genders. What fires me up is I'm tired of the state-mandated control over family in the state. Those are the things that fire me up. But I'll tell you what, when I begin to look into the issues and you look into homelessness and you look into the opioid crisis and you look into the affordable housing issue and you look into the water issues, it's all crazy government control. And, you know, 
I think part of the reason why we're getting a little bit of traction, I think, just in the world, around the world, around, around America, is because I've never heard of a millennial worship leader running for Congress. <laughs> now I know why. <laughs> you know, now I know why, right? Like, you got to raise $3 million. Crazy. Right? You run, I'm running against a, a 45-year-long politician. He's been in politics 10 years longer than I've been alive. He's been, secret, he's been a insurance commissioner twice. He's been lieutenant governor of California. He's been in the state senate. He's been in the, house, he's been in the state assembly. And now he's been in Congress. And guess what? Guess who's responsible for ma the majority of the leftist laws that have come down against family in our state? This guy. And guess what? The district that I'm running for that we identified, because the Lord gave us a prophetic word, District 3, which... We got a prophecy from my friend David Wagner. He didn't even know what we're doing. He said, but District 3, God's going to turn the District 3 into the, dist into, the, into the district of the third day. And there's an awakening coming. Little did we know that District 3 is right in between Sacramento and San Francisco. <laughs> Little did we know the revival heritage, the roots that, that flowed in that district. Little did we know that it is the most diverse congressional district in the state of California which is kind of cool. There's a 10% Indian population, 29% uh, Hispanic, 8% African American. There's a Korean population. And I'm like a nations guy. Like I was just with a bunch of pastors and none of them were white yesterday and I felt more at home. <laughs> I'm like, listen, I look white, but in here there's a lot of stuff going on. A lot of colors in here, you know? And, and little did we know that it's one of the most millennial districts. And little did we know that all of the churches in this district and the churches across California, as I've begun to research this, I am, I am absolutely filled with the sobriety that the church in California is not engaging. Just look at the data. I mean, look at America, for example. 60 million, the evangelical church is 60 million people. People. It's the largest voting block in all of America. But guess what? People say, well, Trump won the evangelical vote. It's not true. He didn't. He didn't actually win the evangelical vote because evangelicals didn't vote. <laughs> Less than 20 million of the 60 million evangelicals are even registered. So I go to Washington, D.C. God gives us this call. I go to, I'll tell you in a minute. I go, well, you're Canadian. You can't register, but, <laughs> but. You will register one of these days. Um, I went to Washington, D.C., and, and the Lord just opened all these doors. The whole reason we're doing this is just it's God from the beginning to the end. And Dr. Ben Carson's team, who I love Dr. Ben Carson. He was, I want, you know, he was my guy. You know? I loved him. I love that he was a believer. I love that he was a doctor. I love that he was not a politician. I was just team Ben Carson, you know. And his team approached me, and they said, you know, Sean, when you look at America— you don't see leaders from the faith space in politics. Uh, the church has abandoned the political realm. You can look at Mike Huckabee. You can look at Ben Carson there in their 60s and 70s. But you have this massive gap where there's no voice. And Christians get on Twitter and they get on Facebook and they whine about the agendas that are coming forth in Congress and they whine of the craziness and they, you know, you look at the data and 20, uh, no, no, 39% of millennials think communism is good. It's a true statistic. 48% of millennials prefer socialism. And you look, there's nobody that's carrying the narrative in the, in the next generation. And so they looked at me and they said, you know, Maybe God wants to use someone like you. Maybe, you know, and they begin to throw their weight behind me, you know. And they normally just do presidential races, maybe some Senate races. They don't do congressional races. Definitely not in California. <laughs> but we had this God-ordained moment together in D.C. And I, and I said, you know what? I feel like, this is what I told him, true story. I said, I feel like God is going, I feel like the church is going to be a huge key to unlocking this next season. And they looked at me and they go, yeah, the church is great. If you want to go to a prayer meeting, they're sweet people. They'll pray. I'm like, no, no, I think the church is going to turn the tide. They're like, well, the church doesn't vote. Everybody in Washington, D.C. knows this. And I'm like, well, that's my whole world. That's where I've lived for the last 20 years. And they're like, well, if you can get them to vote, maybe things will change. 
California right now, 15% of Christians in the state of California vote. It's, I mean, it is crazy, right? And listen, I understand. I moved here from Pennsylvania. I lived in Texas. I lived in Pennsylvania. And I was like, God, there was way better places to like do this in the last places I lived. And I moved to California and I was like, why do I need to vote? I'm not going to change anything. That's honestly what I thought, even though a fifth of all Americans live in this state. (laughs) It's kind of a big deal. You know, I mean, you look, it's the sixth largest economy. It should actually be the third or fourth largest economy. That's another story. But the church is not engaging. And so I was in Anaheim, California last week with a thousand pastors. And a buddy of mine, uh, Pastor Rob McCoy, he's the mayor of Thousand Oaks. He's the mayor and he's a pastor. And the moment that he decided to run for mayor as a pastor, he lost half his church. (laughs) But guess what? He became mayor and this, guess what happened right after that? That that shooting happened in Thousand Oaks. And guess what? A pastor got to be the one to bring reconciliation and hope to his community. And so we were standing with a thousand pastors and they were from, they were all different, like ethnicities, diversities, denominations, like it was just an eclectic group. And these pastors stood up, and this is one of the first times where I have felt the electricity of faith over this issue. And they declared, we will not be silenced. We are going to stand up. We are going to use our voice. We are no longer going to bow to intimidation. We're not going to bow to fear. We're not going to be pushed into a corner. And it's just, you know, I just feel like it is time to mobilize the church to engage. And I was asking the Lord, God, I I really like, I love my life. I I live on 15 acres. I have, you know, four wheelers that I take around sometimes with my kids. It's really peaceful. I have a studio. I like, I get to travel the world. Like the last thing I want to do is, is, is engage in this. But then I look at my kids. And I look at the future that's being created in our nation. And listen, I'm a prayer guy. I mean, Wesley Stacey will tell me, this has been my world. I've planted houses of prayers and furnaces around the world. But at some point, our prayers have to take action. At some point, we have to become the embodiment. And so I've been asking the Lord, God, why, are you, why, why is this happening? And, he's, and, and I've just been reminded of those prayers, those prayers that I prayed sometimes I wish I never prayed them when I was 16 and I was with you know 400,000 people on the mall in DC and Wesley and Stacy were there and we were praying for revival in America we were praying that God would raise up people to stand for righteousness in our nation we were praying that people would stand up to fight for the unborn 60 million babies that have been slaughtered. We're praying that God would raise up righteousness and leaders would rise up. Over the last couple months as we've lost friends and it's been a real season of clarity, we felt the nearness of God so much, but it's just been, never been through anything like this. I've never been in a darker realm of society in my life. Never been in a darker nation. Never been anywhere that carries the heaviness and intensity of this realm. But the Lord's been reminding me, hey, you prayed those prayers when you were 16. You prophesied this into being. And I want to read out of the book of Malachi really quick. This is um, my uh, roadmap for my campaign. (laughs) Malachi chapter 4. And there's so many issues. I think that the difficult thing now is I I can't really unsee what I've seen. And I'm not here, I'm not here to stand on a party platform, to be honest. I'm not, you know, Christians are not blue or red. We're purple. We wear royalty. (laughs) That's what you get when you mix those colors, just FYI. (laughs) I got kids, so I know, you know, you mix mix blue and red, you get purple, and uh, we as believers are called to carry royalty, and just as King David, you know, he, he embodied the heart of a worshiper, you know, and he was a worshiper when he was 
a farmer, rancher or whatever. And then when he was in the infantry as a military leader, and then he carried the spirit of worship all the way to the palace as a politician. And most of the book of Psalms was written as David being a politician. It's interesting, huh? Some of you guys were looking at me like, no, it's true, I promise you. And, and there's a Davidic spirit that God's calling us into. And, you know, I don't, I wish that I had the, um, this is a David and Goliath fight that I'm in. I don't actually have the prophetic word that I'm going to win. I think it's possible. And I think if we win, it would turn heads all across America. I think it is possible. It's David and Goliath. Those are the kind of battles we're summoned into. But more than anything, I feel like in this season, we're called to summon a generation of worshipers to engage in the political realm. Yes, that's true. Got one amen. Thanks, Wes. You know, there's seven mountains of influence. There's only one mountain whose tentacles touch all other mountains. Every other mountain is dictated by one mountain. Every other mountain is regulated by one mountain. But yet the church, I find in the church, like, oh, you want to be a millionaire? Yeah, let's go. You want to be a sports star and thank Jesus after you throw a touchdown? Come on. You want to be a, you know, a pop star? Yeah. You want to be a politician? What? But yet the mandate is go into the whole world. But yet the mandate is bring him crowns before his feet. But yet the mandate is that every place worship will rise. Malachi chapter 4, I want to read this. This is what uh, Chris and Bill prophesied over me at Bethel, and it's partly their fault, this whole thing. <laughs> and, you know, even as I'm speaking this, I, I, to be honest with you, I have, I have really great hope for California. But I'll tell you, it can't get much worse. Things got to get better. And I think if you read the bills, I would just encourage you, you know, those of you that live here especially, to dial into the bills that are coming down in in, uh, Sacramento. There's a a good friend of mine, um, State Senator Shannon Grove. I don't know if you guys are familiar with her. She's, yeah, she's fire. Homegirl can prophesy. We were together in the Bay Area last night, and she's just marching around the stage, and she brings that spirit into the capital in Sacramento. I mean, she is a, a firehouse, and so God has placed people in strategic positions, but I'll tell you, if the church in California engaged and actually voted, if they engaged in the civic duty that every American should, <laughs> this whole state would change overnight. That's actually not a prophecy. That's just math. It's not like a prophecy. Well, it could have. No, no. It's just, it's the mathematics of how many believers there are. If believers just took it seriously and followed Romans 13 and followed, you know, 2 Timothy and actually engaged with what God said to engage with, give to Caesars what Caesars, if we engaged in that sphere of society, things would really change. And it would change for our children, you know. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have 15-year-olds. They want to go get their ears pierced in California, they got to have an adult with them. They want to go get a sex change at 12, they can do it without any adult consent. This is happening on our watch. I mean, this is like, and that's why I'm saying there are moments where you hug the lamb, <laughs> you know, like Jesus in the nursery picture. And then there are moments where you make a whip. <laughs> you know, and when it comes to the future of our children, I feel really, really fired up. Okay, Malachi 4. Verse 2, but for you who revere my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays, and you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Then you will trample on the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act. Verse 5, see, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. I was just with Mike Bickle a couple weeks ago, and I love it when people ask him this, you know, because it's getting darker. It's getting lighter. You know, everyone thinks we're going to be destroyed by Iran, for example, but yet Iran is the fastest growing underground church in the world. <laughs> it's like hashtag things you don't hear on CNN. Like 
Iran is exploding with revival. Like I get messages every day from pastors there, pastors in Iraq, like literally the government cannot contain the explosion of the church there. They're having what we call a baptism shortage. They're having a pool shortage problem. There's not enough pools for everyone to get baptized in. That's literally one of their prayer requests. You guys are like, I'm serious. Like, I'm talking to these guys. Like, like the, take, for example, Saudi Arabia, right? The, under, the, the MBS, Mohammed bin Salam, who's the leader in Saudi Arabia, one, the crown prince, one of the most powerful figures in the Muslim world, right? Guess what? Guess what he did? Super sneaky. He bought the most expensive picture in the history of mankind. He spent $450 million on a picture of Jesus. Painted by Da Vinci. Right? And so everyone at this auction, I think it was in Paris, they were like, what's happening? Who spent $450 million? People were just shocked, right? It's the most expensive piece of art in the history of the world. Nobody knew who it was. This journalist traced down the money trail through all these companies, these shell companies, and guess what? It came right back to the crown prince. I have friends in Saudi Arabia that say the most expensive picture in the history of the world of Jesus Christ is hanging in Mohammed bin Salam's house. Yeah. <laughs> and that's like exciting, I think. <laughs> this is like the leader of the Muslim world. I mean, it, so like God is up to things in our generation. We were just in India. 1.3 billion people live in India. Right now, the church is exploding so fast in India that it's almost at between 7 to 8% Christian. They believe in the next 5 to 10 years, it could be 20 to 25% Christian in India. I hope you guys like curry. <laughs> I mean, like God is moving at such a historic pace all over the world and so it's like yeah there is darkness and you know Isaiah 60 says you know darkness covers the face of the earth darkness is over the people but the glory of the Lord arises on you so it says here referencing the prophet Joel again this is the great and dreadful day of the Lord well which one is it it's both welcome to 2020 <laughs> really dark but really bright we're in a day, I believe, this is why this is a day of compromise, because there's no gray area. Either you're hot or you're cold. He will turn the hearts of the parents to the children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. So you see this promise, it's the last verse in the, in the Old Testament that God is going to repair the family unit. I mean, I think if you look at, at, at all of the issues of our culture, you know, we've researched them. I mean, we are in the issues so deep right now. I am on the phone. I was on the phone today with guys that are experts in the opioid crisis. They've been studying it for 40, 50 years. They've been developing policy. I mean, I'm like, I have policy up to my ears. Like, I used to, like, this used to be filled with, like, voice memos of song ideas. Now this is all policy. You look through my notes, it's just the policy on all of the issues that are happening. And California is the example of a state that is being run into the ground in every way. That's why I'm saying we live here. There's only one way it can go from here on out. It's gotten so bad in so many areas. I mean, economic, you know, 700,000 people left California last year. 700,000 people fled California. They went to Texas. They call it Texodus. I don't know if you had friends that did that. You know, they fled to Texas. They went to Idaho. There's entire businesses that are set up right now. Some of the most profitable businesses in California are moving relocation businesses. I have friends that work for them. And they relocate people to Boise, Idaho. They relocate people to Denver, Colorado. They relocate people to Texas. You know, and I actually grew up in Montana, and so we, I always grew up with this, like, all oh, those Californians coming in here, you know. <laughs> so funny. And now I drive back to Montana with California license plates. <laughs> but there's been a mass exodus. We're going to lose, California's going to lose one, maybe two congressional districts. It's never happened in history. It's got the highest poverty rate in America. 
One of the highest drug addictions. Obviously, 25% of all the homeless in America live in California. Three homeless people die every day on the streets of L.A. And as we look at this data and as we call people and as we research all the issues, you guess what? The only answer to the homelessness crisis that has worked in America is the church. You guys with me? Like, the church. I talked to a guy in Dallas. He's, he's got a massive platform right now. He's transformed the city of Dallas. And what he did is he went in as this worshiper policy guy. And he changed all of the policy that was handicapping the church from engaging in the homeless crisis. Guess what? In a few months of the church engaging, it was gone. People had jobs. People were in mental health facilities. People got help. People were engaged. But in this state, they've handicapped the church. I mean, we were walking into church yesterday. I was walking into preach, three services in the morning in the Bay Area. There's feces in front of the whole church building. Can't even get through the door. And they can't do anything about it. The police can't do anything about it. Nobody can do anything about it. And I'm telling you, God has given divine solutions for every problem we have. But we got to engage. I want to see a Jesus people movement again in California. Anybody with me? I believe that there's God has planted people here that are not leaving. I thought about leaving. (laughs) Still think about it sometimes. But I'm like, no, we have to fight. This is the golden state. This is the state of revival. This is the state of prophetic promise. God, you are not finished with this state yet. And God is raising up people from the north to the south, from the east to the west, all along this state. And people are beginning to engage again. There's hope again. You know, our big, you know, campaign thing, I mean, I, literally, I, I don't know any other way to do it. I just bring my guitar to everything we do. I'm like, let's not even talk about government first before we seek a higher government. (laughs) Let's worship, you know. And we got like a lot of conservatives that are not church folks that are in our crew. And I'm like, we're teaching them. We go door to door when we go canvassing. And I'm like, when we go door to door, let's pray for people too. Who cares who they're voting for? Let's bring the presence. Let's bring the kingdom, you know. But Malachi 4, this is our calling to be carriers, like not just revival, not just conferences, not just meetings. It has to shift to reformation of society. It has to shift to reformation of culture. It has to, it, it has to change things in our cities and in our states. It has to change things on the university campuses that have been houses of, of, of indoctrination for far too long, used to be epicenters of revival. I mean, I was on the campus of Harvard, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Brown. Guess what? They were all ministry schools. They started, they were, they were born in the first and second great awakenings. And now they're places of, 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 of atheistic thinking that promote man over God. It was never supposed to be that way. We need a move of God in America. And I'm telling you, and I, I'm, I'm coming with like a lot of like, and I'm not, I'm, I, I'm actually, I'm really happy. Everyone will tell you, I'm like the joy guy. I'm perpetually optimistic. I really am. That's the realm I live in. But I'm beginning to realize the sobriety of the season that we're in. And I believe that Christians, we do not have the right to abdicate this realm of society. We have to engage. If you're not registered to vote, register. That's your one homework assignment, okay? Register to vote. Go online. It's very easy. Register to vote. Engage in your civic duty. The primaries are coming up. I wish I was running here. I'm not. But register to vote. Engage in the primaries. Find the issues. Get behind people. There's good people that God's called to do this. Don't be apolitical. The church doesn't have a role to be apolitical. Don't buy into the separation of church and state garbage. 
That was never the intention of the founders of America. I mean, good night. Look at, it's like, I I deal with this millennial thought that America's inherently bad and America's inherently horrible and America was inherently slave owners. And I'm telling you, listen, yes, there were mistakes made in our nation. Everyone will agree on that. There were really bad mistakes. But I grew up on the East Coast right next to Cape Henry. When they came over, from England on ships, they were looking for land. When they spotted land on the, on, on, on the coast of Virginia, they put down an anchor, and for three days they fasted and prayed. Then they got in the little boats, they went to land. The first act that they did was they planted a cross on the shores of Cape Henry, and they dedicated the continent to God. Now listen, it doesn't mean that everything was perfect. But I'll tell you this, all of the failures of America are universal. What does that mean? That means every nation that's ever existed had the same failures. You can't name one nation that didn't have the same failures America had. All of the European countries, most of the African countries, most of the countries in Asia, they all had the same issues. They exploited people, they did horrible things, but guess what about America? All of its goodness is inherently unique. We standing here, guess what we're celebrating today? 1947, Auschwitz. Today, you know what happened? A nation thousands of miles away that had nothing to do and no vested interest sent a million soldiers to fight a man named Hitler that killed six million Jews spilt the blood of their sons and daughters on the beaches, lost lives to defeat the greatest evil the world's ever seen. Name me another country that's done that. And we did it again in Japan. And we did it again in Iraq. And I've seen the mass graves that Saddam Hussein obliterated. 200,000 Kurdish people that he annihilated with chemical weapons. Guess what? No one else stood up. It was America. America. All of our goodness is inherently unique, meaning there's never been another nation like this. Doesn't mean that we're perfect. We've got a lot of issues. I will admit that. But the point is, is that God has a calling on this nation that's irrevocable. And he's looking for believers that believe in it still. He's looking for people that believe in the inherent goodness of the plan of the fathers of this nation. There's a lot of bridges that need to be rebuilt. There's a lot of things that need to happen in our culture. And there's a lot of healing that we need to release to the world as the church. But we got to believe in God's plan for our own nation. I'll tell you, as I travel the world, whenever these guys pop up in these nations, whenever they pop up, whenever these dictators, whenever, guess what? They may say, shout death to America, but who's the first one they call? (laughs) Red, white, and blue. Every single time. For hundreds of years, it's been like this. And I'm just, man, I am passionate. I am passionate. Again, prefacing the fact that I never even wanted to live here. (laughs) I didn't even want to go to college. I was a missions guy. I grew up, I got baptized when I was 15 years old in the Amazon River with piranhas swimming around. I was like gone to the nations. But I'm realizing in the landscape of the world, if we don't take our place, no one else will. And so I just want to pray tonight and and I want to believe for a massive turnaround. And I'm telling you, California is the key. In fact, it was interesting, and regardless, I don't, you know, I'm not here to share my opinions on the president or whatever you believe. I don't really care. But we got invited in as worshipers to the Oval Office, which I don't remember the last time a president invited 60 rando worship leaders <laughs> in the middle of impeachment, you know. It's like, <laughs> and we're not like, like, you would probably know some of them, but most of them you wouldn't know. It wasn't like a publicity thing. There's, there's nothing we can help him with, <laughs> you know. <laughs> But we're just sitting there, and we 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 are in the West Wing, you know. Actually, we were so we were worshiping, and uh, Mike Pence came in, 
who's the vice president and was a Bible teacher. And he came in and he said, I canceled all my meetings today. I heard there's worship in the White House. He's like, there's nothing more, there's nothing more powerful we can do today. So he came in and literally he's just going, and we're like, this is not like, like baptist Methodist kind of work. This is like Holy Ghost, rock pile, explosion, tongues, worship, wildness. Like we're just being who we are, right? And Mike Pence is in their worship bin, and then Ivanka Trump comes in, and then, you know, a Sam Brownback comes in, and, and all these, you know, kind of the czars over the different departments are kind of streaming in. And then all of a sudden, we're like, hey, come to the West Wing right now, you know? And we're like, what? You know, it's just, we're just in there just singing. Yeah, come to the West Wing. And so we're like, what? So we're in the Eisenhower building, which is in the White House complex. So we get ushered in by Secret Service, and... I wish I had the pictures. You can look at them on on my social media. But we walk into the West Wing, which is like, we're all like, like, literally, it's just like millennial random worship leaders. Like there's a girl that is a worship leader of a 70-member church in Louisiana. There's another guy here from Missouri. And there's another guy, like, it's just, and we're, we go, we're about to walk into the West Wing, and there's the Marine guy that's standing out there like this, you know? And, he, like, he can't move. He can't move. Like, it's like a law or something like that. So we're in front of him, like, doing all this stuff, trying to get him to move, not flinching. And then we walk into the West Wing, and we're trying to play it cool, like we've done this before. Oh, yeah, 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 cool, yeah. We've been here, you know? But we walk in, and there's, you know, a picture of George Washington on the wall, and Andrew Jackson, and... And then we get ushered into the briefing room, which is where all of the czars of the government, the head departments, meet once a week to go over the vision and the plans for the most powerful government in the history of the world. And so we're sitting down at these chairs on this table that's been there for ever. And the health and human services czar, I forget his name, he comes in the room and he goes, he goes, what are you guys doing in here? We're like, uh, somebody told us to come in here or maybe meet the president. I don't know. You know, and he's like, well, he's like, this is the room where all the decisions are made. This is the room where, you know, every week we meet and we make the decisions and we go over the budgets and we make the calls. And we're like, really? We go, Shakarada. we put our hands on the table, start praying. And then, you know, in the middle of impeachment, then the president comes in. In the middle of our prayer. And we're like, ah, you know, it's like a freaky moment. We're like, ah. And, uh, and then, you know, and, and then he randomly invites us into the Oval Office. He's like, hey, ah, let's go into the Oval Office. And his aides are kind of, well, they're like, Mr. President, there's a lot of people. He's like, oh, come on, you know. So we follow him through the door. We file into the Oval Office. And it's so crazy, right? Because, I mean, I'm into, like, West Wing and, like, all those things. You know, you see the trap doors. And it's like, you're really there. And we're all just like, play cool, play cool, play cool. You know, when we walk in, and then he sits down at his desk, and then we, we, we go around him, and he goes, okay, pray for me. And we're like, okay. And he goes, pray for me. And he goes, China's on the phone. Pray for me. And then, so we start praying, and we're just like praying, like bold prayers, like prophesying, like declaring stuff. And then, and then he's like, okay, okay, two more. China's on the phone. Two more, two more. China's on the phone, you know. <laughs> And, and we literally, and so, and the last thing that I, I got to do before we left the Oval Office was I turned to him and, you know, knowing the whole impeachment thing and all he's going through. And I said, you know, I shook his hand. I said, Mr. President, um, I, I'm from California. And he goes, oh. And I go, and, you know, knowing that the two kind of leaders of impeachment are Californians. And I'm like, I'm from California and I'm running for Congress and I'm a worship leader. And he goes, wow, Really? And I was like, yeah, we're praying for you. We're praying for you in California. And what was amazing about the whole thing is, and I know that other presidents have had, um, you know, prayer in the Oval Office. And, and by the way, if Obama invited us, we would have gone. If Clinton invited us, we would have gone. But any, listen, if a president invites you to pray in the Oval Office, you go. I don't care what your political opinion is. I mean, it's just an amazing opportunity. And so we went, but what was amazing about the moment is the Lord began to show me these prayers that we pray in the house of prayer, right? These things that we declare all the time, God, that worship, let it fill the nations. God, let worship fill the industry. And then all of a sudden it's like Kanye West comes out with a worship album. <laughs> like the number one rapper in the world. Like my kids sing his songs on the way to school. 
Like, I would have lost anything. I would have lost all my money betting that. And you look at that, and you look at Times Square lit up in blue that says Jesus is king. 13 million people walk past it every day, right? Jesus is king. And you know what? In the house of prayer, you know what we got to start doing? That was us. Like, we got to celebrate that. And not be like the Christians who are like, well, I don't know if he's really saved. And I don't know why he did it. And I don't know what his motives were. Who cares? You know, worship leaders get invited into the Oval Office. Well, I don't know about that president. I don't know. Who cares? We've been praying that worship would go into the White House. We've been praying that worship would go into the Oval Office. Like, and we just got to be people of God that celebrate it. God is moving in the earth. He's moving in California. And as much as I'm coming in here tonight, like fiery in my heart, because I, to be honest with you, I, I didn't know what we were up against. And I want to return back to not knowing, <laughs> you know, but what we're fighting for, it's worth fighting for. It's the future of our children's children's children. You know, we're concerned about what, what, what is our life going to look like in five years? I'm concerned with what is my life going to look like after this? I don't know. I've like, I don't know. My life's a hot mess after this. But God says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I think in three generational increments. <laughs> what I'm doing in you is going to extend to a generation you'll never see. So let's stand up tonight. I want to just pray. And I want to just, I want to thank you guys for journeying with us, and please, like, I tell people, you know, Christians, I'm like, I, we don't really know what we're doing. We're trying to figure it out. You know, we're, we're not perfect on this, this journey, but, but we do feel called into this arena, and, you know, we would just really covet your prayers in this season. We really would. I, I, uh, I've, I've never been more urgently dependent <laughs> My wife laughs at it. She's like, babe, you went into like North Korea and didn't ask this many people to pray for you. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, but we really need it now. We need prayers. We need encouragement. We, we need people to rise up with us. And we need people to be activated. Tell your friends. Tell your neighbors. Tell your, like, vote. Let's vote righteous legislation. Again, not, not red, not blue. Let's vote purple. And unfortunately, in our day and age, a lot of times it falls into one of these, those two categories. But let's think with the mind of Christ. Let's engage in our calling and our civic duty. Let's be people that not just pray the prayers. Let's do the works. Amen. And so pray for us. Join us. Uh, follow our campaign. Please follow our campaign. If you want to give, we need three million bucks. Like, good Lord. <laughs> Open the floodgates of heaven. I've re listen, I've raised a lot of money for refugees, for children at risk, for missions projects. I've never had to do anything like this. And it's tough. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, I go into these meetings and some of the guys are like, man, you just, just tie your hair back. You know, people take you more seriously. I'm like, no, man, I got to let it fly. <laughs> got to just be me. You know, if we're going to win, we're going to win just being us, you know. I'm going to win fighting for the unborn. I'm not going to water down any of my issues. I'm going to be who I am. But I just long to see worship invade the Capitol building. Congress's rating is at 9% among Americans. <laughs> Can't get much worse. Maybe a couple fresh faces in there, you know. I got another buddy of mine who's a worship leader running in Ohio. Got another friend that's a pastor in Texas. Like, we're stirring it up. We're stirring it up. Maybe some of you guys should run. Huh, let me see. <laughs> let me prophesy. <laughs> uh, but no, we, we just love the prayers. But Jesus, we just thank you. We thank you, God, that we get to live in a prophetic yeah. land of destiny. Yeah. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in the state of California, God. We thank you that you're raising up a church that's not going to cower into the corner. 
Lord, we thank you that we're not waiting for the Holy Spirit ambulance to rescue us from this darkness. But Lord, we're called to be salt and light. We're called to be the people of God that rise up in bringing heaven's solutions to the earth. I pray right now, God, that you would download solutions to every issue that faces this region right here. I just feel like God's going to download issues. He's going to download solutions to the issues that plague. And I don't even know all the issues in this district. What you guys face may be similar to what we have, but God is going to download solutions for homelessness. He's going to download solutions for for drug addiction. He's going to download solutions for for, uh, uh, the sex trade that's happening in this region. He's going to download solutions to agriculture. Why shouldn't we have the solutions to agriculture? God, we ask you, give us the keys to unlock things in the Spirit. And Lord, we just, I just speak this Billy Graham quote over you. When courageous men take a stand, the spines of everyone else are stiffened. Sp- stiffen the spines of the church in California. Yeah. Yeah. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Come on, let's give a great big clap. Okay, okay. So uh, tell us one more time, what is the area that you're running in? Where is it? District 3. District 3. So they just go on and the internet will tell them what District 3 is. Well, it's basically basically the East Bay, the bottom uh, uh, county touches the East Bay, and then it goes up through cities, Fairfield, Vacaville, uh, Yuba City, and it kind of goes up into some... Napa? uh, tiny bit of it wow. touches Napa. Wow. Yeah, we like that part. Yeah, we like that part. <laughs> okay, so listen, stay, you can say standing. Everybody receive an envelope. Tonight, we're going to give to Sean Foyk's ministry. All right? Do you understand that? Not the campaign. That's Not legal. to the campaign, <laughs> but uh, he is already tonight, we've, we've given an honorarium. We've got that also, but we want to bless him over and above, and when you bless him and their ministry, they are empowered to get things done. And some of you are watching on uh, live stream. You can give to Sean Foyk's ministry through the healing rooms. And even tonight, and I think, do we have a, uh, how to do it? <clears throat> and so right there, there it, there it is. Ways to give. Healing rooms, AC. What's AC stand for? Apostolic Center. There you go. I should have known that. Okay, so online, many of you are going to watch this, <clears throat> this uh, message after today, in February, in March. You're going to watch this. This is going to go everywhere. I want you to consider giving into Sean Foyk's ministry, and you can do so by uh, writing checks to Healing Rooms or go online. What's your um, website? For ministry? Yeah. Uh, SeanFoyt.com. SeanFoyk.com? Yes. And they can see all how to give to you Everything. there. Everything. Everything's there. Everything. Everything's there. Okay, so let's do this. Let's give tonight. All right, let's give tonight. We want to see a man with this heart, I mean, just blazing up and down, up and down, up and down. Right? Okay, now, also, you're, you know, about, Joel 2 says, blow the trumpet. The new modern-day trumpet is a cell phone. I want you to start sending this link to as many friends as you can because people need to hear this message tonight okay you can mobilize people through sending the link to healing room santa maria this very message we're going to make that available somehow i don't know how tech people know how big brian knows how bryce knows how wesley does not know how but uh you got to get this this uh link and you're going to start sending it everywhere and thirdly and uh, Cindy Goff and I and others are stirred up about this. We have to begin to mobilize in the state of California that people will vote. We were with Lance Wall now, and uh, we were out in Monterey. We had a whole night. We got all stirred up. We said, you know, own your vote. Own your vote. Get like an own your vote me- uh, uh, movement where people start to be stirred. How many percent are not registered in California? Well, when we looked at the stats last, I believe it was, I think there was less than 40% that are, that are registered. And 
uh, about half of those vote in a, only half of those vote in a presidential election. Wow. So, um, yeah, it's really bad. So, bad. actual voting people in California, how many actually get to the polls in the end and vote? How many million? No, oh, what I, percent? Uh, probably 15 to 20 percent of okay. Christians. Okay, did you hear that? This state can change if people would be educated on the issues and register to vote. That's as simple America as that. could change. America could change. And, the, and the, the congressional representative in your district, I mean, it's a federal position. He's representing you in the halls of Congress. And so it's probably good to look up his voting record and what's he all about and what's he doing because he's a representative of your values. And there's a lot of guys that are not have good values that might be representing you. So anyway. So we're, we're going to make this available. So let's tonight, let's, uh, let's give the Sean Foyt's ministries. And uh, I bless you as you do it. I bless you. Deuteronomy 15, there's going to be no poor amongst us. Why? Because we're going to raise up standards that are going to take care of that. And God will richly bless you. By the way, uh, he has excellent CDs back there at the uh, table. I've listened to all of them. I play them all. They're my favorites. We travel together. <laughs> He's my favorite. And by the way, Shiloh, we've got a bunch of Shiloh little cards back there. Um, hold that for a second. And uh, take them to pastors and churches and direct, because we have an incredible uh, event coming with Shiloh. Okay, so we're going to do the announcements. And then... After the... Okay. All right. So let's, uh, let's hear the uh, announcements, and we're going to release you. You know, say a blessing. Wow. <laughs> you know, Sean came here and poured out his heart, and I just feel like we can't let him leave without stretching our hands toward him and praying for him and his wife and his kids and, and just the ministry of getting into politics. So let's all stretch out your hands and let's pray for him. Yeah. Pray and prophesy over So, Father, I thank you for Sean and his wife and his four kids. And, Lord, I ask that you would release the favor of heaven upon him. All these things coming against him, yeah. I yeah. break the power of it yeah. in the name of Jesus, and we say, yeah. stop it no more. That's and it. And we That's release it. favor from heaven That's over it. you, your wife, your kids, everything you own, everything you touch, yeah. in Jesus' name. Come on. Father, we thank you for the call of God that's on his life. We thank you for the favor of God. We ask that a favor would multiply and increase, Lord, in every sphere that he influences, in every group that he meets with, Lord. Let him yeah. release a fire in America, a yeah. fire that was represented by, that happened where he lived, but let it be the fire of the Holy Spirit raising people up to take action right. and do exploits in Jesus' name. That's right. Yes. And we release Psalm 125, verse 8. And the scepter of the wicked shall not remain Come on. in the hands, but it shall be given to the righteous. We take the scepter of the wicked away from District 3, and we decree it, right. and we put it in your hands, Sean, today. Yeah. We put that scepter of righteousness in your hands for your district to the glory of Jesus. Yes. Father, we ask, God, that Malachi 4. Yeah. Lord, as you raised up John the Baptist, Come on. all I keep hearing in my head is a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Come on. Make straight the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Lord, we ask, God, that you would so amplify Sean's voice Come on. that that spirit of Elijah that was on John uh, the Baptist, Lord, that you prophesied in Malachi 4, would be on him, and he would be a voice crying in the wilderness of California. Huh. Lord, that he would cause many to repent, that he would turn many to righteousness, even through this new platform. We are asking, God, that you would use him to cause your kingdom to come and your will to be done in the state of California. We ask, God, that you would use him as a voice crying in the generational wilderness of, of the, the millennials and the generation Y and the Gen X, we ask God that he would turn many to righteousness in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we ask for the breakthrough anointing to be on this man, mighty yeah. God. Father, 
even though he might face the walls of Jericho, Father. It was praise that brought the walls down, Father Mighty. So we ask, Mighty God, that as he sings at every meeting, Lord, the, the praise would reverberate out throughout this land. And Lord, that we would pick up that dollar note and say, yes, and God, we place our trust. Yeah. We ask that that would happen today in Jesus' name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Father, we thank you that it's not by might. It's not by our power. But it's by your spirit. Yeah. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Yeah. The Holy Spirit of God, where all things are possible. We bless right now with a kingdom blessing. Sean, I thank you, Lord, that you put in your word in his mouth as fire. And there's going to be a fire, a raging fire of your glory and your power that's going to be manifested as never before across the state of California and across from California, across the United States. And as I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, that we're not, we're taking off all limitations and we're saying, Lord, you do it by your power, and we commit, we commit right here in the healing rooms. Right here, we commit to, to hold him up in our prayers. And I thank you, Father, it's just that there's going to be a, a force of faith that's going to shake this nation, beginning right here in the glory coast of California. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The Lord says to you, you're in the very forefront of the wave, yeah. the tipping point. Yeah. God says, I'm going to overturn the plans of Satan for California, and I'm going to do, it, as indeed you said, uh, you are a David in front of, it's much more wow. than just your yeah. race. God says, I will overturn the plans of the enemy, and I will set California back on the path that she is to to go on, and God says, it is not by might or by power, but by my spirit, I take the foolish things, and I confound the things that are mighty, those that are, I'm upending, I'm upending and uprooting the plans of the enemy. Rejoice, this is, this is a time of victory for you. All right. And we just shout. Grace with shouts of grace, 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 that grace. this political mountain is coming down. We decree it over yeah. shot. I just feel like God has taken his golden boy and put him in the golden state to be a golden voice for the purposes of God. And nothing, nothing will stand in the way that God has has for your path. Sean, I feel the Lord is so proud of you. And it's Psalm 35. David says, God, put on your armor, get your sword, prepare for battle, and that heaven is fighting with you. And we join heaven and fight with our mouth, with our prayers. We fight with our vote, and we fight with our pocketbooks. Yeah. In Jesus' name. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, Sean, we say there was a Joseph who stood before a Pharaoh, and Pharaoh said, I don't like my dreams, and I don't know what to do, but I need Joseph. The Lord says, I'm going to help you be like Joseph. Yeah. And Pharaoh will turn over his wealth and his authority. Watch it and see. Get ready. Amen, amen. It's good. Okay. Well, tonight we focused on healing the land. And healing government. That was our focus tonight. Phenomenal. And so uh, I just want to bless you as we go. Tonight, the Lord spoke to Moses, and he said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you bless the people. You say to them. So I'm going to say what God commanded to be said over the people. He said, say, the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, the Lord cause his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his eyes towards you and give you peace, shalom, long life. And so he said, I will put my name into you believers. I will put my name in you and I will bless you, says the Lord. 